Kadisha. Kadisha. <laughs> I didn't know I was mutilated as a baby until I was 15. My clitoris was cut off when I was a week old, and this is something that happens to nearly all the girls in the Gambia. It's called female genital mutilation. When I was 15, I was brought to America to marry an older man. When he tried to have sex with me, that's when I realized what female genital mutilation was, and that's when my horror started. When Khadija was born, I knew that I could never let this happen to her. I knew that I had to do something to stop it. Most of the girls and women you see on the streets have been cut. Their clitoris was cut off or worse. This has been going on for thousands of years. I've come home to try and do something to end it. Even if that means taking on my family, my tribe, and the whole of Gambia. So what do you guys think about when it comes to the issue of FGM? But we should not stop it. You don't think we should stop FGM? No, we, we, should, we shouldn't stop it. Do you want your wife to not have any desire or you want her to fully enjoy what you're enjoying? The circumcision normally came in to stop that too much of feeling the woman is having. It's natural. God gave it to her. Why stop it? I don't need to cut my daughter's body parts to make her, you know, stay calm, to make her stay a virgin. No, you need to protect your daughters. Don't mutilate them. It's not helping them. Like, I've been through it. It didn't help me. This is the house I grew up in. We lived in one apartment with my mom, and then my stepmom lived in the other apartment. My family in the Gambia, we are Sarahulais. When I was growing up, my dad had three wives, and he has a lot of kids. You know, the number of siblings I have, I think at least 30 of us. The youngest ones, I really can't name. I had to call them and be like, who's your mom? So it's like, I mean, I have a lot of siblings. This is where the mosque begins at. My father is an imam, and he built the mosque behind our family home. He boasts when it comes to his kids, especially his daughters. None of them dishonored him by getting pregnant before marriage. All of them were virgins. The fact that my dad had other wives and other kids, I, he did it more than my mom did. You know, as a child, you were jealous because you wanted to be the only ones. And every time he was away, you felt like they were taking time from you and they were taking time from your mom. So you just look at her and know that she didn't feel happy sharing her husband.
It was very much a sort of lay tradition that women didn't get educated. Me and my sister, we were the first girls in our family to be enrolled in school. My mom felt like it was very, very important, even though my dad was against it. She was very strict, but with me, she was lenient. Like when I come home and say, I would never marry a guy that has another wife. I would never let my husband hit me. She just used to sit and laugh. <laughs> when I was eight years old, my marriage was arranged to a guy that lived in New York. My bride price was paid. I wasn't eligible to live with him because I was still very, very young. And when I hit puberty, that was when I was going to be eligible to get married. As a Sarahulia girl, it's not abnormal for us to have our marriages arranged when we are very, very young. If you're actually over 18 and you don't have a husband, people think that you're expired in some kind of way, so that's a problem. When I was about 13, my mom found out that she had breast cancer. I remember being in a hospital with her when the doctors told her that she only had a few months. She looked at me and said, don't listen, they're not God, that's not going to happen, they're lying. It was hard to let go because we were very close. Gamsara is the most conservative, hardline, and hostile place that you can go and talk about FGM. It's a village that has 100% of women cut. It's where my family is from. This is Gambisara. When I was young, I would spend the whole summer there and going to the farms. Assalamu alaikum. I haven't been back since my mother passed away. The whole village came out. It blew me away because I wasn't expecting that and knowing that I came here to discuss FGM. This was my mom's room. That was the last place that I saw my mom alive. The last place that I heard her laugh. No, I'm not going to be a man. I'm not going to be a man. I'm not going to be a man. I'm not going to be a man.
This was the first time there was ever an open debate about FGM. And it's really, really amazing. For women like her, they've never seen an uncut woman. They don't know any other way. The lack of basic health care is a huge contributor to the issue of FGM. You know, Gamasara doesn't even have a good hospital. We live in a society where in women are made to believe that, you know, you have to bow down to your man. Men tell women we want our daughters cut and they cut them. My aunt, my sister told me that this is how we lived. I shouldn't have been taught to accept those kind of things. When I was 15, I was brought to America by my dad to get married to the guy that I was promised to. He was in his 40s. I arrived in New York on Christmas Day. My husband was at the airport to pick me up. He wanted to like touch me and hug me and I didn't want him touching me and I kept hitting him. As soon as I get to my aunt and uncle's house, there was people, there was cooking, there was everything. And I knew that that was it. The night of the marriage, they had like an older woman kind of like a sex advisor that would tell you about what to do. You know, this is the position to make it more comfortable, or this is the products that you can use to kind of lessen the pain. This woman actually baits you. She rubbed perfume lotion all over me. They dressed me. They made me wear white lingerie. They made me wear these waist beads. I told my dad that I didn't want to get married. I begged, I pleaded, I did everything to just ask him not to make me go through this.
They took me to his house. When I got there, they took me inside the room. They have this tradition of making you kneel to your husband. Then they left me there by myself with him. I cried the whole time. I cried for my mom and felt like she could have been here. She would have saved me. I was having pain and difficulties with sex. He couldn't really penetrate me. After days of trying to have sex and not being able to, they said maybe she's infibulated. In my tribe, we are mutilated when we are about a week old. The clitoris is cut, as well as the labia and the vagina is sealed, leaving only a tiny hole. When you're infibulated, you can't really have sex until you're cut back open. That's when they decided to take me to a doctor in downtown Manhattan to be reopened. I don't know what he used, but it was like a gel. And then he did what he did. It was painful. And this doctor told me I had to have sex right away in order to keep it open. That's when I realized what it meant to be infibulated and what FGM actually means. It's just something that women never talk about. You know, they never talk to me about the pain. They don't tell you that sex is going to hurt forever. It's just not a conversation that we have. We have a culture of silence. You know, FGM is um, a practice that you can't reverse. Once a girl has gone through that, it's a practice that they live with for the rest of their lives. But when I got married, because I was infibulated, if you know what infibulation is, literally you can't have sex until they reopen you. And when you're also delivering your baby, I have three kids, but each time I deliver my babies, they literally have to cut me open. And that's because I've been through FGM. The clitoris of a woman is sensual part of a woman's body. That's how you feel, that's what makes you gain pleasure. When that clitoris is cut off, you don't get that feeling. Every time your husband is having sex with you, when he's enjoying it, you are laying there in pain, and that's not fair to women. Is it a sunnah? Oh. FGM is not sunnah. But I, um, they before yesterday, they said that FGM is a sunnah. The Prophet does not condone violence against women, and FGM is actually violence against women. After she got married, we would call each other all the time. While she was there, it was constant, like, crying. She was 15 and she was expected to be a wife. The guy would, like, threaten her with violence. It was just awful for her. Being forced into a marriage is one of the hardest things that you can ever go through because to me, it's like rape. You just can't tell me anything else. When you force a girl into a marriage, you've given someone the right to rape her every single day.
No one in my family would listen to me. They thought it was normal. And then someone that knew my situation called this woman who was leading the international human rights organization, Equality Now. That's when Taina Biename came into my life and showed me that it wasn't normal, it wasn't okay. I kept telling her, if you can escape, there is a police station down your block, or come to the office or come to my home. It was an emotional tug of war that she was going through. How can I extricate myself from this violence without totally divorcing from my family or without turning my back on everything I know? It got to a point where and it was so bad that I just was like, you know what, I have to leave. She called her father and told him that she had been in touch with women's rights organizations. And I don't know whether there was a fear there that they could be reported, but he allowed her to leave the apartment to live with his brother a few blocks away, still in the Bronx. It was like a sense of relief when I found out that Jaha had left that marriage. All she could think of was like how she could get back into school. I was living with my aunt and uncle. My aunt didn't think I needed to go to school. So she didn't help me find school. I went around at least 10 different schools in the Bronx and they wouldn't take me because I didn't have a guardian with me. Finally, I went to Taft and they enrolled me. The root cause of FGM and issues like child marriage is also because of the lack of education. Jaha comes from an ethnic group that does not believe in girls' education. The average age of marriage is 14 years old. Just bucking that tradition alone made her somewhat of a, of a pariah. After my marriage ended, people made my life hell. Everyone looking at me like I brought shame on my family. My aunt, she'll be talking to her friends that they said, she's this washed up girl that has already had sex. She's not a virgin anymore. No one wants her. And I would be in the room listening to what they were saying and it killed me because I was, you know, I, it's not like they said it behind my back. I was right there. At one point, Jaha got so miserable that instead of like going home at night, she would sleep in the subway till morning before she would get off the subway and go to school. I was fighting everything. I was fighting to survive. I was fighting to get an education. And most importantly, I was fighting to be who I wanted to be. When a human being suffers severe trauma, like Jaha, and then being in an environment where she was not supported, she was in trouble. She was in deep trouble. I received a call telling me that Jaha was in the hospital. She was at St. Vincent's and she had uh, attempted suicide. I had enough. 
And I would have rather died than going back to what they wanted me to be. Taina was there a lot. She brought me books. She made me believe in myself. She made me feel that my life wasn't worthless. When I left the hospital, I realized that I needed to get away from the Bronx. And that's when uh, she told me that I'm done fighting. All she wanted at this point was to just get out. The only way that she knew how to just get out was to just let them arrange a second marriage for her. I told my dad, regardless of what happens, I will stay in the marriage. He called me and told me that my marriage was fixed and then I'm moving to Atlanta. So at 17, I ended up remarrying. I felt like it was rushed. She was still pretty traumatized from the first marriage. I didn't want her to go through with the second marriage at all. But at that point, she just wanted to leave New York and everything that had occurred in New York behind her. My husband, Haji, he was more open than the first marriage. He was more open to my ideas. He was in, in the business of controlling me. Daddy's gonna go make you food. Come on, go with daddy. Come on. We started a family. First, I got pregnant with my son, Mohammed. And I got pregnant again with Khadija. Mommy, uh -huh. I look beautiful. Yes, you look beautiful. You look more than beautiful. Ah, you look beautiful. And then I had my little boy, Abu. Abu! <laughs> After Khadija, I started working for Wells Fargo as a part-time teller. You want to be like mommy when you grow up? Really? Khadija, are you behaving yeah. while mommy gets dressed up? I went to Atlanta to visit Jaha. You want to be awesome like your mommy? She was able yeah. to work at the bank, being a wife, <laughs> being a mom, and she was great at it. I was like, it seems like you didn't make the right decision after all. I remember being at work and talking with some of my friends about their relationship. You know, at that point, then you realize, okay, am I missing something? Because the things that they're talking about is not the things that you're experiencing. I thought sex was just painful with my first marriage. But then when I got married the second time, it was the same story. Then I started talking to other girls that are African that have been through FGM. And I realized that they were all feeling the same thing I was feeling. So it just made me want to research, trying to find answers, trying to understand my own body. You know, how can I enjoy sex? How can I reverse this? Once I found out that this was permanent, it just kind of made me something has to change. I started contacting imams, and I asked them, is FGM a religious obligation? And where in the Quran is that listed? And then they can't answer that question. 
Islam has nothing to do with FGM. Made me realize that I needed to tell people the truth that this is not a religious obligation. It was just, you know, people's selfish need to control women. Came up with the idea of me starting a blog. I started talking about my own experience. Eventually, that kind of evolved to Safe Hands for Girls. Are you guys ready? Go! Survival-led organization against FGM. I was able to get other girls to join me. Come on in. <laughs> girls that have been through FGM. We want to be the big sisters in your life. Whatever questions that you have, we are here for you. Women that are here in the United States that have been cut, no one is trained to answer their questions. When they go to the doctor, they are looked at like a freak show. This is somewhere that you can come to without being afraid, without being ashamed, because I'm trying to get us to break the cycle of abuse from the past generation. We see a butterfly. I love butterfly. Me having a daughter was like, you can't say this can't happen to my daughter and then watch other people's daughters go through it. You guys can play. Me and Auntie Naima can sit and chat. Naima was one of the women who got involved in safe hands with me early on. Naima's hat. I know. Come sit next to Auntie Naima. Come sit here. Just like that. All flat in the back. I was born in Nairobi, Kenya. FGM is something that's a big part of our culture. It's a rite of passage. For my mother, that's a gift to me, something that would help me get into womanhood. Okay. Let me know if it hurts, OK? It happens between the ages of five and nine. For me, it happened about nine years old. It's going to be very fast. I actually looked forward to it. This is something that happens to all the girls. You get gifts, there's a party. On the day of my cutting, my mother led me to the room. All her friends and neighbors were sitting there waiting. The cutter hadn't shown up yet. I volunteered to go get her. And I held her hand as we walked up the hill. Little did I know these were the same hands that were going to violate me. I was brought into the room and I told to sit down. I could feel the cold cement underneath me. All the kids were out playing and I could hear the chatter. The cutter sat in front of me and picked up the razor. They started calling out for my mom and I started to struggle. And then at that point, the other two women on either side of me then held my legs down and my shoulders back, um, where I couldn't move at all. But I fought, I fought hard. I, you know, as I could feel the blade cutting um, and blood just gushing out and just the pain, I, I can't explain. After it happened, everything was different. I, I was a pretty much straight A student. That went downhill. I'm hot. You're hot? Oh, She's no. trying to take off her shirt also, no. You can't take off your shirt though, you're a girl. Come around. It sucks, I know. It's not a nice rule. I'm gonna play with the doll. I know for a fact that there is long-term effects as far as PTSD and also girls and women being more docile. You got it? When we first started Safe Hands for Girls, it was more to provide support to FGM survivors. How many daughters do you have to? But then I found out that it was bigger than that. And uh, what do you think will happen to them if you do end up taking them back to Gambia? Same thing that happened to me. They're going to get mutilated. There's also something called vacation cutting, where girls are sent to their parents' home countries and they go through FGM and then they come back to the United States. Is that the reason why you've been afraid to go back home? Yeah. 
is no reason why children born here in the United States should be at risk of something like FGM. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight is dedicated to Safe Hands for Girls. The best thing that we have is our own voices. I urge all of you to not stay silent because whether you've been through FGM or not, you know someone in our community that has been through FGM. It is a moral obligation for all of us to stand up and say enough is enough and we have to end this. Mother, I draw breath from you. I have lived in you, longed for you, loved just you. But my love is The first time I talked about FGM, I felt exposed. I felt vulnerable. Like I just laid my soul bare. They took from me my humanhood, promised me womanhood, left me with no clitoral hood, no clitoris. It's such a taboo back home to talk about it. It felt weird. You have rearranged me, barred my sexuality, shaved away these lips, ground zero barren land. It's something that happened to me and it's hard for me to talk about it, but I think it's, it's necessary. I do not blame you for, you never knew better. It is up to us to speak up, be someone's voice, hold someone's hand. It is up to us to end this practice. Then I saw a news article from the UK. They did this petition there, and as a result, the education minister was writing to all the schools to set up guidelines to deal with FGM. I thought, what an amazing idea. And I was like, you know, I can do this in the US. <laughs> Will you kick me again? Me and you gonna have real problems. <laughs> I went on Change.org. I wrote a petition. I wanted the Obama administration to conduct a study on FGM in the United States. Kill mommy. Kill mommy. Okay. I started tweeting about it. I started looking for people to support the idea. What's that? It's a survey about FGM. What's FGM? Female genital mutilation. <laughs> And then Equality Now decided to add their name to the petition. The Guardian also came on board. We as a paper have committed to an international campaign to eradicate FGM. Slavery was a culture in America for over 300 years. And if culture triggers human rights violation, then that piece of culture must go. Sign our petition on change.org and help us end FGM in the United States. When The Guardian came on board, the numbers started going up. We went from 10 signatures a day to thousands of signatures a day. Just past 83,000, that's amazing. We started getting more exposure with the media. That just helped us take it to a whole new level. Over 200,000 people in signed our change.org petition. People will think your mama is right and Obama needs to do something. Female genital mutilation is barbaric and should be eliminated. This shows that ordinary people can believe in something and make a difference and make a change. All it takes is passion. I was still working at the bank. I decided to take a leave of absence till things cooled down a bit but things didn't cool down, they escalated. When we say that we want to end FGM in a generation, we need to make sure that we are actually doing that. Foot binding actually took 10 years to end in China. But I believe if we really push it, 
we can end FGM in 10 years, just like they did with foot binding in China. Thank you. I hope that you will continue to mobilize the public opinion. I hope you will continue using your power to influence more world leaders to take action. You can count on the United Nations. Thank you. I'm going to take a selfie, if that's okay. fine. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> Good hey, <laughs> <laughs> okay. you want to see my eyes directly? <laughs> okay. Say bye. Oh, oh, thank you. Okay. All the best to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yay! <laughs> Abu, you made Banky Moon. Give me five. Uh, thank you. Hi, bye. The Girls' Summit is the international summit that focuses on forced marriage and FGM. How can we understand this practice so we can end it? And how to know how they feel about the issue. I didn't go through FGM out of hate. I didn't go through FGM out of torture. You know, even with my early marriage, I've never seen it from a place of hate. It's just what their culture is. It's just what they know. It's a quite great job that you all out of, of Africa are doing here that the change can have to happen there. It's yeah. people they have to, to, to stop here. My campaign has had a lot of success in the US, and um, I've been thinking about a way of doing something in Gambia, because me advocating for everyone else in the world while it's still happening in my own home, it doesn't, it doesn't make, make sense. Yes, baby. I want to bring the work that I'm doing here in the U.S. to the Gambia and organize like a youth conference. I started reaching out to people that I knew that were committed in the Gambia. Having a youth conference will be really great. Over the years, most of the people that have been campaigning are older people. If you can get like a team of organizers together. If we have the money, I think we can pull it off. The Guardian and the Girl Generation will be supporting this event. Let me worry about that, and I'll let you guys worry about what's going on in the ground. We don't have a lot of time, but I really want it to be a success. 100%. Uncle. Uncle. Bye. Organizing this conference, it brought young people into the conversation. I know the sensitivity of FGM, but I think it's very, very important if the Gambian government will just give us the opportunity to listen. And I have both my fingers and toes crossed, so thank you. Some people think what Jara doing is bad. So what I believe, I believe my wife, I know a strong woman, he helped in my community, that's all I believe it. Has the media also started um, confirming their attendance? Yeah. Um, you can give Kumba the go ahead, she can print the banners, they look good. I'm needed more in the Gambia than I'm needed in the US. It's going to take um, a lot of commitment and dedication, but I think we can do it. I'm going over to my dad's house before the conference to talk about why I'm campaigning against FGM, telling everyone else they shouldn't practice FGM while I haven't had that conversation with my family it looks a bit hypocritical. Having this conversation with my dad is part of having a bigger conversation with the whole Gambian community. Today is the beginning of Idul Adha, the festival of sacrifice. My family will be celebrating. 
but I have to tell my father about my campaign. All the girls in my family have been cut. It's something we've never spoken about. I thought there was a lot that I could tell him, but you know he's a religious man, and I just couldn't sit there and tell him what you're saying is not the truth because it would have angered him. It's important to keep the conversation going because my dad has a lot of daughters and they have a lot of daughters as well. If my dad changes his mind, a lot of girls can be saved. I'll go to say hi to everyone. Having the first national youth conference to end FGM in the Gambia. Hi, no, you It's like the coolest thing I think I've ever done. Social media. Do your For you to be able to go abroad, learn something, and then take that and bring it back to your home country and help your own people. That's how things should be. Hi, Amadou. Good. Well, today is the opening of the conference. If he can come here, so he sees the atmosphere, sees you know what this whole thing is about, I think it will be good for the story. Program, we'll go get them. T-shirt for me, small. You guys are okay, right? Ready to go? We invited veteran activists from all the organizations in the Gambia, prominent people from the UN, people from the government. We are working with the American government, now I want to work with my own government. So I'm glad you're here. <laughs> and this has never happened in the Gambia. They've never came together to work on one goal. Those are my kids. They came to see the opening. That's my son, and that's my daughter right there. Well, yeah, but... oh, they try to be. <laughs> uh, Mohammed, you guys need to sit with Daddy, okay? When I first started talking about FGM. For one, I was afraid. I'm a Sarahule, and I didn't know what my family would think. I didn't know what the outcome would be. But I was lucky to have you know, a husband that understands how passionate I am about these issues. And um, I'm very, very pleased that the Gambian government is here, because I think that in order for us to achieve change, we need you guys to help us do that. We need to empower our girls, and we need to make sure that no girl child is at risk of FGM in this country. Female genital mutilation makes it much more likely for you to have complications. If you just look at maternal mortality, and you find out what high numbers we have in the Gambia, time and time and time again, we have people dying. It is all due to ignorance. And what you guys are doing is the beginning of the fight against that ignorance. Let's go on to the next slide, please. This is a real picture. I saw this lady myself in my clinic. This girl was about 26 years old, married for about two, three years, didn't have a child, and was convinced by the relatives that the reason you're not having a child is because you were not cut. So they went to this old lady who used 
a razor blade under no form of anesthesia and they removed as you can see the clitoris and part of the labia minora this lady knew nothing about anatomy she just cut down and when she cut down she also cut the urethra which is the opening that passes the urethra she will be having lots of infections in her life that may destroy her kidneys finally and this girl's sexual life has been totally destroyed Now it is our time to defend the rights of our women. I for one, I will make that vow here. Nobody will never take my quota for this circumstance. I am critical that we always use euphemism. We can't continue to tell people that ye musol samba nyakato bariya chupotile wale ma kuntu menka ke wolo aka kuntu le aka bojele al nga fonyo yeko it's been mutilated we don't have to be ashamed of our body clitoris nyin aben na vagina to ya bondi ye ya kuntu le imana ma ima chupoti ima kuntu le ma What motivated you to start this campaign? To me, it's something that needed to be done because even in the U.S., it's like a taboo. No one was willing to talk about it openly. Do you think the gov there is sufficient political will on the part of the government? We are here to hold them accountable, but we want to work in partnership with them. If they don't help us, we can't achieve what we want. You know, the real movers, the real you know, changes of public opinion are the imams. And even the imam of the president, Imam Fadi, he said FGM is Islamic. I've heard Imam Fadi's claims. He's an elder and I respect him, but I went through FGM and I know how it affects me. And if he needs me to sit down and talk to him about that, I'm open to that. What would be the pinnacle of achievement? If we can get a national ban on FGM in the Gambia, that would, you know, that would be it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I assure you of government's commitment in providing technical support for the implementation of the outcome and recommendations of this meeting. For me, it was important to have the government in front of international media, in front of local media. Will you guys help promote for a national ban against FGM? If we make this a priority, we can actually end FGM in less than 10 years. If we have data coming from the country to say, this is the magnitude of the problem that our women are going through, obviously, we will do something about it. Now we have something to hold them accountable for. The government has raised the argument that there's not a lot of research, but we have the information out there. I've been through FGM. That was in circumcision, that was in cutting, that was female genital mutilation. I am one. I am and I am one. I am one. When you're here and you see that over two thirds of the women in this country have been through a FGM, it's not just some bunch of scientific numbers. You can see them, you can feel them, you can hear them. Your last message to the people of the Gambia. I hope they welcome this, and I hope they understand that I'm, I'm not abandoning my culture. I'm a proud Gambian. I love my culture. But it's just this part of our culture. It's wrong. There's no right. When it comes to changing people's minds, it's going to be extremely hard. But we need to have a huge campaign and travel to every single village and actually have these conversations. I'm going to see the midwife that cut me as a baby. She and her sisters um, carried out all the mutilations in our family. And um, she, she was good friends with my mom as well. My mom loved this lady. I grew up loving this woman. She's like a second mom to us.
making her understand how much pain FGM has caused me might make her rethink and stop cutting. As much as I wanted to be angry and as much as I wanted to blame her, she's as much of a victim as any one of us is. It was passed on to her and she passed on to her daughter and now her daughter's passing it on to her 17 or 18 year old daughter who's also going to carry this on if they are not educated. Coming out of that room, it just showed me what the challenge is in the Gambia. I was naive about everything and being here, I just woke up, like I had to wake up and face all of these things. It's just been a big roller coaster of different emotions since I got here. At times it's like I want to stay and do more, and at times it's just like I want to get the hell out of here and never come back. What did you guys eat at daycare today? I ate sandwich. You had a sandwich? Yeah, I ate sandwich. Sometimes I forget that I'm a mom and I have kids and they should come first. But I'm also getting heavy in debt to run this campaign. Like sometimes I think about Wells Fargo and my job there. If I was at the bank, I would be running my own branch. There's good pay and it has benefits. My children don't have those benefits anymore. And FGM, it's worth it. If we don't, then I don't know. No. 
let me talk to Uncle Sin. I was looking at um, the newspapers today and I saw that in Bakote, over 100 girls were circumcised and I saw the quotes by Imam Fati. I mean, it's just yeah. really, really sad that we just did this conference and, you know, now you have these girls being cut and then Imam Fati coming out and supporting it. I think what happened there was as a response to what we have been doing. Imam Fati is the most influential religious person in the Gambia. I've lost hope, to be honest. I really thought we can do this, but right now, I don't know. Yeah, come on. Right now, you're not here, but we have started a, a campaign that we cannot stop. The conference has given me this energy to face Imam Fati. I do want to meet him, don't get me wrong, but I know his history with other campaigners, how he has publicly shamed them. You know, Imam Fati is not an enemy that we want to have. But the point is this. Everybody listens to Imam Fati, but nobody wants to challenge Imam Fati. We meet him and then ask him real questions. We might get something, um, you know, convincing from him. When I got there, the campaign was really taking off and it lifted my spirit. A number of foundations gave us money to set up information booths around the country to inform people about the effects of FGM. Your mother or your aunts or your sister that have been mutilated and have children, do you hear them saying that they have any health problems? You disagree with it? So you know the health effects of FGM and you don't want it to continue? Let's go. We had amazing volunteers. So we can go to the for the first time, we got people talking about FGM in the streets, in their houses. Huh? Why are you saying this? In Mecca, yeah. female genital mutilation is not practiced at all. So if FGM was that important to Muslims, why isn't it practiced in the Muslim capital of the world? In Saudi, FGM is not practiced. In Yemen, FGM is not practiced. Like, no, that one is a new thing to me. OK, it's FGM is not prescribed by Islam. Even Allah didn't think about putting that in the Quran. My brother, I think it's not necessary. I think we don't need to put our kids through that much pain. Uh, it's like I'm somehow about to be convinced. I'm having one. Maybe I can save that one. Please, I would love that. One thing that keeps coming up more than anything else is Islam and FGM. All right, thank you. We need influential religious leaders to make that clear to people that this is not a religious application. We are on our way to meet Imam Fatih, and um, he's like the most influential Imam in the country. He's always on TV, radio, and print media. And he uses those platforms to spread his pro FGM messages. He was the State House Imam to the President. He's also a member of the Supreme Islamic Council. I know how critical he has been of other campaigns in the country. I am very nervous about meeting him. I'm very anxious. I hear about you and your campaign. You are fighting female circumcision and say that it's not Islamic. No one who fear Allah mm -hmm. says circumcision is not Islamic. Mm -hmm. It's Islamic. Mm -hmm. Our mothers, mm -hmm. our grandmothers, mm -hmm. they are practicing this practice. You cannot point your finger a single girl in the Gambia that she was die because of she went through circumcision. Have you it? Uh -huh. When I was about eight years old, my dad has um, four wives, and one of my stepmom, her daughter went through FGM, and then she later bled a lot, and as a result of that, she died. 
she was my baby sister and she was my stepmom's first child. And that's not a lie. You can go to my dad's house and talk to her. You know, hurting people, torturing people, it's not right in Islam. I am confident in what I'm doing. I'm not doing this because I'm getting paid to do it. I'm not doing it because someone is telling me to do it. It's just when I got married as a 15 year old and when I delivered my kids because of the scar tissue that I have and the pain that I went through, I decided for myself that I wanted to do this. And you know, with my dad, he's still not convinced that what I'm doing is good. But my yeah, father is a popular man in the Sarakule community. So when you are now leading the campaign against the, that, your father will never agree with you. He will prefer to lose you mm -hmm. than to lose his faith, mm -hmm. his Islam, mm -hmm. and his community. I'm not perfect, and no one is perfect. No, we all make perfect. mistakes, and no, I'm new at yeah. this. I'm yeah. going to you know, sometimes get it right. Sometimes I'm not going to get it right. And it's very important for me to learn from people like you because of you know you're very influential and you're very credible you know your religion we must educate people about female circumcision uh, do it is better than not do it most people believe that it's a religious obligation we say it clearly mm -hmm. if you want to do it do it if you don't lift it but no, okay, it's not compulsion. I, I like that you said that. Okay. And I think um, if we can make that clear to our people, that it's not something that compulsory. That's clear here. It's a choice, right? It's it will a choice. be a choice. It's a choice. So we agree on that. For someone like him to say that it's a choice, I think will make a difference to people that think that this is a must. You get what I'm saying? That's, that's definitely true. So like we can use that as an angle of our campaign. Like I don't have to agree with everything he said, but in life you have to know your strategy. Jaha is a visionary activist. She keeps lighting matches, hoping that somewhere, someplace a fire will start. When I first started working, in the Gambia, my main objective was to get FGM banned. We've been working on that, doing a lot of lobbying, writing letters, lobbying government officials, lobbying the president, lobbying the first lady. It's the first step. It's not the end of this conversation. It's not going to end FGM overnight. We need not, we need not descend into the political arena, yeah. but we have to be politically savvy. Exactly. Yeah. We have a really, really good relationship with the Minister of Health. I'm honored and privileged to be here. Thank you, guys. So we agree. Since we started campaigning in the country, everything we have done, we've had some type of government involvement. There's a national steering committee on FGM, and this has been headed at the Women's Bureau. You know, we have a national plan of action. The government is doing more. I think that's a direct result of what we did at the first National Youth Conference. Minister, thank you. I see you. Uh, Call you next. Jaha's mission is really to get the culture to come to her point of view. She has begun making inroads at every single level, from the grassroots to the highest levels of religious and political authority. Nothing will stop her from reaching her goal to end FGM, nothing. We are going over to my dad's house. Um, his youngest wife just had a baby. I want to talk my dad out of mutilating his daughter. To not mutilate baby Khadija, it's going to be very, very important to me. She was born when I'm here doing a campaign against SGM. If I was to leave this country today and find out in a few days that she ended up getting mutilated, it's going to break my heart. If I can't prevent my own sister from going through FGM, as an um, activist against this practice, then what I'm doing is not really effective. Khadija, Khadija. Khuram matan people. 
Nisan. Hi baby. Hi baby. Bah lampare. Mana masa? Kan ini Allah yang garu, Allah yang garu mana yang nama? Kian ini lah ni. Anna bani ke rumah dia? Boleh tak? Sunnah. Kamu ke rumah? Rumah ni. No. No, mana mama saya kimpe sange, kamu kah dapat ni? Mana saya kaya, kau yang ada dengan kahana kaki lima muci ni, tu kahana turu, agak wat TV feeling ni, angka. Anda siapa mana kahani suruh ni ni agak lulu ni? Mana ni? Seno ye? Okay, pai kau ni kini, buat tak makan ini kerana tu. Mana mama saya? Mana masa? Nanti kada ni bah, kada nyari bah ni. Kita sudah nyari anak. Ah? Mana masa kena alam tak kunjung? Jangan tak kena minum ni. Kada wala kada kini ngah kini. Kada hui ini ngah. Kau kini puna awal ramah rundi hina ni. Ah? Kini mbak kena tanam mangada baranta dapat. Mbak itu. Mbak mbak kena tanam mangada baranta dapat. Mbak kena tanam mangada baranta. Mbak itu anak aku nanti tengah ni kan. Insya Allah. No, 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 no. My hands are not ready. I have so much respect for my dad. I never want to tell him something that I think is going to hurt him. But in this case, I didn't care what he thought. I just think it's important for me to tell him why this girl needs to stay the way she was created. I'm sitting here talking to him. My dad is not even arguing some of the things he argued a few months ago. As a result of my campaign, he's actually spent some time to research FGM and how harmful it is to women. It's huge for him to actually accept that and for him to say that. I'm going to be the first baby in my family to not go through FGM. Mwah. Mwah. My dad agreed not to cut baby Khadija. Like, I, I am still yet to process it because, you know, I don't even know how to take this in. No, seriously. You sure? High five. Okay, bye bye. Good night. I think Jaha is a young woman of destiny. There aren't that many people like Jaha who can surmount all of the obstacles within the context of her culture. Three days after I met with most of his cabinet members. I received a call that the president was about to make a big announcement about FGM. For 21 years, I've been researching to see where it is stated in the Quran 
that this should happen, I've not seen it. As from today, FGM is banned as from today from the surface of this country. Uh, the President of the Republic of Gambia has just declared a ban on FGM. I want Gambia to know how proud I am and how happy I am that this happened. And today I wanted to thank His Excellency on behalf of all the girl children of the Gambia. He told me that what his daughter will not go through, he won't see another girl child go through. And to me that says everything. This is going to change lives in the Gambia. It's going to save a lot of young girl children. Knowing that I played a role in that was just amazing. Jaha's campaign together with Safe Hands for Girls is very important because if the president is now denouncing the practice, it's because young people have taken the lead. So I think this is not the end of our work this as activists. We want to go into the communities and make sure that people are aware the president has done his part. Now it's up to us. What Jaha has already accomplished at the tender age of 25 is nothing short of extraordinary. It is extraordinary, and it's nothing short of a miracle. Banning FGM is huge. Now, at least girls like my Khadija in the Gambia will have a chance against FGM. But we need to maintain an active campaign on the ground. The problem is a lot of times we find that countries ban FGM, but they don't implement the law. We need to build on the momentum to make sure that the government actually implements it. This is just the beginning. It's not over yet until all the girls are protected. <laughs> our Africa. We're doing it for ourselves. We're doing it for our daughters, our sisters, our mothers. That's what we're doing and it's simple.